Born to the Dark. Let's just sing it together. Born to the darkness I was, rejected and cut off from hope. I couldn't see his love for me. They said he's not who he seems. Don't get your hopes up for him. But lies fell away when I saw his face. My heart burst to light. I saw delight in his eyes when he looked at me. My whole world's on fire, alive in the presence that burns inside of me. The song that I sing all of my days are filled with your praise. All of my days are filled with your praise. My heart burns to life. I saw delight in his eyes when he looked at me. My whole world's on fire, alive in the presence that burns inside of me. Take my song away My eyes were open when I saw his face No one could ever take away my faith My life was changed the day that Jesus came Let's do that one more time No one could ever take my song away my eyes were opened and I saw his face. No one could ever take away my faith. My life was changed the day that Jesus came. Amen to that. Oh, my heart burst to life. I saw delight in his eyes when he looked at me. My whole world. For your own. 
So when I was a little kid, there were two things that I thought I wanted to be when I grew up. One was a pilot. The other was an astronaut. And so when I was growing up, I learned everything that I could about rockets and airplanes and learned about the principles that made for flight. And a little bit later, I got to go and visit uh, Kitty Hawk, where the first powered flight happened with the Wright brothers. And one of the things that I learned was it was really interesting to see the different things that people tried along the way to figure out how to fly. And some of them were pretty creative and pretty ridiculous, actually. And you've probably seen films of different types of uh, airplanes or powered aircraft that they tried to come up with. Uh, sometimes they want to duplicate birds. I'm not exactly sure what's going on there with holding the bicycle wheel up there. Maybe that was his landing gear. Uh, but uh, it didn't work. And it wasn't until the Wright brothers came up with their right flyer and were able to figure out the principles that allowed for flight, like lift, and that they were able to accomplish it. And I think the thing that's really interesting is that the principles, the dynamics, the physics, everything that was needed in order for flight to happen had existed since the beginning of time. But it wasn't until we figured out how to use them, how to employ them, how to make them work for us that those principles like lift allowed us to have powered flight. And now, in a relatively short period of time in the history of the world, we're now flying things like this double-decker jumbo airliner things that would have been unimaginable just a few generations ago. The reason that I thought of that is that this passage that we're going to look at today talks about how we can be in the path of God's blessing. And that's something that all of us want. We all want to be on the receiving end of good things from the Lord and the principles that allow for that to happen have existed since the beginning of time. And in this passage, it shows us how we can place ourselves in the path of the blessings of God. Just like 
arranging an airplane, designing an airplane, allows those principles of flight to allow us to take into the skies. The focus verse for this passage is 1 Peter 3, 9, where he says, don't repair, repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. And what is happening here, as we've already talked about, is that we have a group of believers who find themselves on the receiving end of oppression and injustice. And because we want to be in the path of blessing, not cursing, because we want to be in the path of good things happening to us, not oppression and injustice, the question becomes, well, how do we make things right? How do we put ourselves in the path of blessing? And the temptation that the Apostle Peter is dealing with here is to say, well, since I'm being mistreated, the only way that I can make things right is to pay them back in kind. But instead, he says, you don't repay evil for evil. You don't retaliate. Instead, you pay them back with a blessing. When people do you wrong, you do good to them. And then he gives the reason that that is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. In other words, the way that you get in the path of God's blessing is to do as he does, where he does good to others regardless. So today, we're going to talk about this concept of blessing. And the blessing uh, blessing is, uh, you know, kind of a churchy word, but it just means on the receiving end of good, doing good. And what we're going to say is that this passage teaches us that we do good towards others regardless. And that's a theme we've already touched on. And as a result, we good, get good from God as a consequence. It, this isn't uh, a reward as much as it is, this is just the way things work in God's economy. You reflect God by doing the right thing regardless, and as a consequence, you put yourself in the path of God's blessing. And then as an application, the challenge, the way that you can apply it, we'll talk about doing an undeserved good for another. So welcome to Cornerstone Online. This is our weekly experience where we inspire and equip you to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, knowing that following Jesus makes life better and makes you better at life. If you're new to Cornerstone, we would love to be able to welcome you personally and stay in touch with you and encourage you and keep you up to date with what's going on with our church. So if you're new here, start here. Go to our website, cornerstonenh.org, and click on that New Here link. Or wherever you're listening or watching, you can text NEW, the word NEW, N-E-W, to our church number, 603-225-2550. Let's look at the passage. We're in this series, through, working through the book of First Peter, and we are in chapter 3, and it's a relatively short passage today, reading verses 8 to 12, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God called you to do, and he will bless you for it. For the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord, the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we look at your word today, I pray that you would give us insight, that you would give us understanding, and that you will show it, us how it applies to our lives individually. Lord, we all want to be on the receiving end of good. We are all troubled when we see injustice and oppression, and we want to see things made right. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to entrust the making things right to you. 
that we would know how to and see how to apply this to our lives so that we might do good to others as uh, ir- re- just regardless of their deservedness of the situation because that's what you do and we are called to reflect you. Lord, help us, give us understanding, help us to know how to apply it and help us to know how to put ourselves in the path of blessing from you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are in this series, as I said, First Peter, working through the book of First Peter, uh, and it's called Outsider Insider because these overarching themes go throughout the book, that we are outsiders to the power structures of the world sometimes, but we are insiders in God's family and in God's kingdom. And there are these three words that show up at the very front of the book, the very first verse of the book, that uh, provide uh, a framework for the themes for the whole book, that we are the elect. And that means that we are selected, but it's not God playing favorites. It is his blessing us so that we could be a blessing. We are selected, but we're selected for service. We are chosen in order to be of service to others. That we are also sojourners, uh, kind of an old world for someone who word who is for someone who is just passing through because this world is not our home. Therefore, we shouldn't be surprised if we're not in the power structures of this world because this world is not our home. And then thirdly, that we are scattered, we're dispersed in our world for a purpose, that each of us has a mission and is in effect a missionary wherever we find ourselves. Now, the theme of today's message has much more to do with the idea of being insiders and that we are the elect, that we have a calling on our lives. And as we explore that, we'll see how being, fulfilling that calling puts us in the path of blessing, just like designing the wings correctly on an airplane will allow, uh, will leverage the principles of lift to allow the plane to fly. So earlier, we've uh, seen how the Apostle Peter sums up this by saying, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. In other words, there's a way that is fitting and appropriate for you as a follower of Jesus to live, and especially so among the people who are not following Jesus. Now, last week we looked a little bit at this theme because I we were looking at marriage, and I showed you this picture from my son Jonathan's recent wedding and how I used this as an illustration of the scriptures that say that wedding or marriage is supposed to paint a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. It is showing to the world what that's like. And that it comes from Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. This is a great mystery, but it's an illustration. He's talking about marriage. It's an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. In other words, In this specific instance, marriage, it's supposed to paint a picture to show the world what the relationship between Christ and his church is like. And that is broad. That's just a small application of the much broader principle that we are supposed to image Christ to image God to the world. And that goes all the way back to the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. In Genesis 127, it says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So whether it's marriage showing what the relationship between Christ and his church is supposed to look like. Whether it's creation, where God creates us in his image so that we might reflect his image, show the world what God is like, that's a principle that is throughout the scriptures. So when it says that we are supposed to do good, that we are supposed to be a blessing to others, that's just another way of saying that we are supposed to image God to the world because his character is good. And as a result, he does good. When he transforms our lives, puts his 
spirit within us, we reflect his character to the world, or we should, and therefore we should be doing good. We should be blessing the people around us. And so this passage is just an uh, another application of that same principle, that we do good to others regardless, because that's what Christ does. That's what God has done. That's what God has done in sending his son to die on the cross for us. We did not deserve it. We did not earn it, but he did it nevertheless, because he does good towards others regardless. So we, as his image bearers, do the same. And when we do, we get good from God as a consequence. So in this passage, we're going to answer three different questions. The what, the how, and the why. So let's look at what. What are we supposed to be doing? <clears throat> Just like in the bottom line, we do good to others regardless. So let's look at how this passage starts. First Peter 3, 9 starts with the word finally. In some translations, it says in summary. What that tells us, what he's saying in this one word is, I'm going to give you an overview. We've been looking at some specific situations. What are you supposed to do if you're not the person in power and the person in power is not treating you well? And he looked at how that happens in government, how that happens in the workplace, and how that happens in marriage. So we've just gone through all those different specific applications, but now he's going to give some summary principles. He says, this applies no matter what. This is what I've been talking about. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. There should be unity. There should be seeing things from the same perspective. Now, in those passages that we've just looked at, it started out by talking about how our response to authority is a reflection, not so much of the people who are in authority, but our reverence for the Lord, for the Lord's sake, he started out by saying. Uh, and then in each of these different applications, he would say, in the same way, in the same way. In other words, all of this is under the umbrella of reverence for the Lord. And so I think when he says, finally, all of you should be a one mind, he's saying all of us should be looking at this situation, what it's like to be under authority, what it's like to deal with unjust authority. We should be looking at it from this one perspective. What's the Lord's perspective? That when we submit to authority, when we follow the lead of a of our authorities, when we do right to and by our authorities, even when they are not doing right or doing right by us, we are having this one perspective that we're doing it out of reverence to the Lord. So he's saying this should be our perspective, no matter what of these, which of these specific situations situations we're dealing with, no matter which of the situations you find yourself in, we live for the Lord to reflect the Lord and for the sake of the Lord. And that's the one mindedness that I think he's talking about. And even this goes to marriage. Remember the purpose of marriage is oneness. It's that theme that keeps coming up over and over again. Uh, often, the way that I think about this is that whenever I go into a situation, I want to see the situation and I want to see the people in that situation from the Lord's perspective. Because he sees clearly, he knows everything, and so I ask to see things through his eyes, to uh, laugh at the things that he laughs at, that the things that break his heart would break my heart, that I'll see things from his perspective. And this is the promise that we have as followers of Jesus, that we can be of one mind because we are tapping into the mind of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, it says, we understand these things for we have the mind of Christ. What's he talking about there? When you become a follower of Jesus, when you commit your life to Jesus, when you receive spiritual life, eternal life, when you're born again, all of these are just different ways of talking about that first step of crossing from death into life 
becoming a follower of Jesus. One of the benefits of that is that God comes and resides in us in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit shares the thoughts of God with us. And that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he writes to the church at Corinth. We understand God's perspective. We can see things from through his eyes. We can think his thoughts after him because we have the mind of Christ. Then he goes on, Peter, back to the first Peter section, and he's just giving some different aspects of what this looks like for us to image Christ to the world, to be his image bearers, to reflect him well, to do good to others regardless, and put ourselves in the path of God's blessings. The next thing he says there is that we sympathize with each other, uh, that we see things from the other person's perspective. This is the same kind of thing that the Apostle Paul talks about when he's writing to the Romans. It says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Then the author of Hebrews does the same kind of thing when he says, remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. It's a sharing, it's a seeing things from the other person's perspective. And it says, if you want to be a blessing to others, one of the ways that you can do that is to put yourself in their shoes, to try to be understanding. Uh, I just went away for a short trip to uh, run basically a, a big errand, and it was a blessing to be able to do this to New York. And when I came back, Sue Ellen and I had been apart for a couple of days, and it was really kind of funny, kind of sad, but we were just missing each other. Do you ever have a situation where you're, you, 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 Things just don't go relationally because you're missing each other. And when I got home, Sue Ellen and I were just missing each other. It was not pretty. And so as a result, things did not go well in our relationship for that first day that we got home. And then after a day or so, we sat down and we just kind of talked through what we had experienced over the weekend and how each of us had experienced what had happened. And we got to see each other's perspective. We got to see what had happened over a couple of days from the other person's perspective. And there was something that was very healing, very therapeutic, very uh, very beneficial for us to be able to just sit down and do that because we had compassion. We were sympathetic with one another. We could feel what the other was feeling. And as a result, we were more understanding, more forgiving, and were able to make things right. That's the kind of thing that the apostles are talking about, that the scriptures are talking about when it says that we are sympathetic. We see things through and from the other person's perspective. Then it goes on to say to love each other as brothers and sisters. And this is just one word. It's the word that we get the city of Philadelphia from. That's the city of brotherly love. Well, this is that kind of love, the love that you feel, the commitment that you feel for someone within your own family. And because we are a part of the family of God, when you say yes to Jesus, you are not only getting a new relationship with God as a heavenly father, but you are placed in a family with brothers and sisters. And that love that we're supposed to find, not everybody has had this experience in your own natural family, and I get that, but we all know what the ideal is, the kind of love that is committed and faithful and understanding, the kind of commitment, committed love that you find in families. That's the kind of love that we should be experiencing in the family of God as well. And this, of course, goes back to Jesus' own teaching in John 13, verses 34 and 35. First, he says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. He says it's a new command, but Loving one another was a command that they had heard many times before. What makes it new 
is the standard. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. The selfless, sacrificial love that sent Christ to the cross is the same kind of selfless, sacrificial, other-centered love that we are supposed to see and demonstrate within the family of God. In fact, so much so that in the next verse, he says, by this, this kind of love, this selfless, sacrificial love, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to love others like Jesus. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be selfless and sacrificial in your love for your brothers and sisters, just as Jesus was. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. The distinguishing characteristic of Jesus' followers is their love for one another. So everything that we've been talking about is just an extension of that. And then lastly, he says, be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. This has to do with tenderhearted. It's the idea of fellow feeling, that you you have a, a gut response to the what others are going through and what they are dealing with. A humble attitude is a recognition. It's not thinking, uh, as one as many have said before, it's not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not being down on yourself. It is a recognition. It's, again, seeing things from God's perspective. You see your own personal insufficiency in light of the sufficiency of God. So that's the kind of attitude. That's how this happens. And that's the what. This is what it looks like when you are a blessing to others. You have and display these kinds of attitudes. But why do we do it? And the answer that we find in this passage is that that is our calling. When you become a follower of Jesus, you are following Jesus. You are reflecting him to the world. You, The image of God is being restored in your life. And just like God is a blesser, you become a blesser as well. We looked at this key verse before. It's not a repaying of evil for evil. It's not retaliating with insults when people insult you. In other words, you do what God does. And what does he do? Instead, in contrast, pay them back with a blessing. This is what God does. When he encountered a humanity who was, which was in rebellion, which was doing their own thing, which was uh, walking away from him, he sent his son. He moved towards them. He sent his son to the cross to die a tortuous death in order that we might be forgiven, whether we asked for it or not, whether there was no guarantee that we would respond appropriately and correctly to the offer and the sacrifice of Christ. But he did it anyway. He took a rebellious people and he served them and loved them selflessly and sacrificially. And that is what is being described here. And this is the key phrase, I think, of this verse, this last sentence. That, this, this repaying evil with good is what God has called you to do. In other words, if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to act like Jesus. Love one another as I have loved you. And God blesses those who are undeserving. And thankfully, that is the case. And when you become a follower of Jesus, you are signing up for his character to be displayed in you. His image to be reflected in you. And that is your calling to do the same kind of thing, to bless others regardless. And he will grant you his blessing. So he says, this is, this is how it works. Just like the principles of lift with an air, that allow an airplane to fly. If you want things to go well, if you want to put yourself in the path of God's blessing, then you are going to bless others regardless. That 
is a hard thing to do. We want to give them what they deserve, what they've earned. But God gives us mercy. He gives us blessings that we do not deserve. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. And then he calls us to do the same thing. But the only way that you can do that is if he puts his spirit, his power, his love, his character in you. And that happens when we are born again, when we receive new life, when we say yes to Jesus. And that, if you have never done that before, no wonder you're frustrated with this. No wonder you can't find it within yourself to love the unlovely, to bless those who curse you, because you need God's power in order to do that. And it's only when he lives his life through you that you will be able to accomplish that. Sometimes I hear people talking about being a good Christian, and I say, good luck with that. You cannot do that on your own power. There's only one person who is able to live the Christian life successfully, and that is Jesus Christ himself. And the only way that we're going to come anywhere close to that is if Christ lives his life in and through us. So, I will challenge you. If you have never crossed the line of faith, if you've never said yes to Jesus, now is the time to commit your life to Jesus. What do we mean by that? When you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to his forgiveness, that you want what he did on the cross to count for you. And you're also saying yes to his lordship, that he's the boss, that he's the master, that he gets to call the shots in our lives. And as you do that, then your past is forgiven. A new ending to your story starts to be written, and he begins to live his life in and through you, and you, like him, will be a blessing to others regardless, and put yourself in the path of his blessing as a consequence. So how does this work? Blessing like God puts you in the path of the blessings of God. Now, Peter has just been describing what it means to reflect God's character to the world. We do good to others regardless. And he says the way that that works is when you begin acting in that way, then you put yourself in the path of blessing. And in order to uh, demonstrate that, he quotes a passage from Psalm 34 in the Old Testament. He says, for the scriptures say, and then he quotes several verses from this psalm, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days. In other words, if you want to have a blessed life, if you want to put yourself in the path of God's blessing, here's what you do. The, uh, uh, and I'll just read the rest of it to you right here. Uh, keep your tongue from speaking evil, your lips from telling lies. These are all things that are, have, are themes that he's touched on already. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. So the kinds of things that he's been describing, the character qualities, the way that we treat one another that he's been dealing with, he's just saying, this is all based on what God has already told us. This is the path to enjoying life. And then he gives the why behind it. Why is, how does this work? Because the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right and his ears are open to their prayers. I think that this was actually the scripture that the apostle Peter had already been thinking of. Remember at the end of the passage to husbands, it says, you better treat your, your wives correctly. You better treat them well or else God is not going to be hearing your prayers. That's just not the way it works. You don't mistreat others, and then God just jumps to answer your prayers. Well, this is the same thing that he's saying here. The eyes of the Lord. When God sees things, then he acts accordingly. He says, if, if when you start putting yourself in the path of blessing, then God's eyes are open to your situation. And his ears are open to their prayers. Very often it'll talk in the scriptures about God hearing us. And it's not like he doesn't hear us at all times. He's omniscient. He knows everything, sees everything, hears everything. 
but hearing is an idiom for I'm listening and I'm about to act. I'm going to do something about what I see and what I hear. And that's what's described here. Is you put your, when you start reflecting the image of God to the world, then you put yourself in the path of blessing where the eyes of the Lord are going to be watching over you and the ears of the Lord are going to be open to your requests. In contrast, the last, some, the last phrase, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. We started out this message with the assumption that all of us want to be the res- on the receiving end of God's goodness. And he's described, this is how it works. You can't do it on your own, but as a follower of Jesus, God's character is living and residing inside of you, and he will help you to see things from his perspective, to be compassionate, loving, and kind to others, to do good to others regardless of whether they deserve it. And as you do, as you reflect the image of God to the world, then you put yourself in the path of God's blessing. But if you don't do that, If you say, the way that I'm going to make things right in the world is I'm going to take revenge. The way that I'm going to make things right in the world is I'm going to treat them as they deserve. And if somebody mistreats me, then I'm going to give it back to them tenfold. If somebody says something nasty about me, then I'm going to tell the world what I know about them. What you do in trying to put yourself in the path of blessing in the wrong way is remove yourself from the path of God's blessing. But, and when you do that, it says the Lord turns his face against all those who do evil. You shut yourself off from the path of God's blessing. So let's not do that. Let's, even though it's difficult, We have the power of God, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead available to us. Even though it's a challenge, it's something, a challenge that Jesus has met and gives us the power to meet as well. So what's our bottom line? We do good toward others regardless, and we get good from God as a consequence. Now, in those situations, sometimes things don't always turn out well. We can treat others well, and sometimes we don't get treated well in return. And he deals with that in the next verse, verses 13 and 14. Now, who will want to harm you if you're eager to do good? In other words, usually, if you treat others well, you're going to get the same thing back. But we know that that's not always the case, and sometimes good deeds get punished. He says, but even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. And so in this next passage, he says, here's how you deal with it when you bless others and you get cursings in return. And that's what we will talk about next week. But for this week, here is the challenge to do an undeserved good for another. That's just reflecting what the Lord has done for us. And through his power, we can do it as well. Here's what we do. We put ourselves in another's shoes. When we encounter someone, we say, what's it like to to be them right now? What are they feeling? What are they experiencing? What's it like to be them? And then secondly, we ask, what would we want in that situation? If, If you were in that situation, what would you like? What would you like to see happen? How would you like others to treat? you. Not what do they deserve, but what would they they like? What would you like if you were in that situation? And then do that for them. As you do undeserved good for another, you are fulfilling your calling to be a blessing to those around you, even those who don't deserve it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I pray that you would show us exactly how this applies to our lives and show us exactly what you would want us to do. And then through your power, reflecting your character, allowing the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be the controlling influence in our lives. Help us to reflect you well 
to bless others, to do undeserved good. And as a result, we will put ourselves in the path of your good for us. Thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.